for the moment. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. This is Mike Schoon uh, broadcasting from Cuenca, Ecuador. We're hosting our fifth webinar on Don't Waste the COVID-19 Crisis from ASU's Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment and co-sponsored by the Resilience Alliance and IASC and the study of the commons. Uh, today's format, Marco and Marty are going to share how we use the institutional analysis and development framework uh, and how that can be applied to the COVID-19 crisis. They'll talk for uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes each. And after that, we'll turn it over to Adela for um, for your questions. For your questions, please use the Q&A to write your questions in. We'll go ahead and, and introduce them from, from there. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Marco. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, today we will uh, talk about uh, applying uh, uh, different institutional analysis frameworks uh, to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I am certainly not an expert on COVID-19, but as uh, many of, uh, of you, I have been stranded at home for the last few months. And uh, given that we use these frameworks the whole time for our research, we also uh, observe um, governance issues uh, from our lens of, uh, of institutions. Um, one reason to do it this week is that we, at the moment, we are also organizing a uh, summer school. Uh, we, uh, we started this morning. This was already planned as a virtual summer school, so we could uh, actually hold this without any any challenges. So uh, myself and Marty uh, and Adela Slag are uh, the instructors of that summer school that will go for the whole week. So we are also in that way. Uh, this is a way for us also to um, uh, yeah, apply the, the frameworks. Uh, it's a little bit homework for ourselves, uh, apply the frameworks to a, to a different topic than uh, some of the participants in that uh, summer school. So I will not uh, go in detail to the frameworks. I, I assume a lot of you are well familiar with the, uh, with the frameworks that we use, but for those who want to learn more about it later, uh, I will refer to this uh, free textbook that uh, uh, we wrote a number of years ago. I will now talk about the institutional analysis and development framework. And um, before I do that, I'll, uh, and, and, and how to apply it to the COVID-19 uh, uh, case, at least uh, for a number of questions. I will first uh, say a little bit about uh, the, the IED framework, uh, given that not everybody might be intimately familiar with it. So this is a framework developed by Eleanor Osterman and her colleagues um, uh, starting in the, in the 70s, uh, been applied to many different cases. And like any framework, it's a way to, to create a common language here, common languages to uh, to study governance issues um, and we uh, distinguish the, uh, the action arena where we uh, have action situations and participants and they are influenced by the biophysical conditions, the uh, attributes of the communities and the rules in use. Uh, these action arenas lead to outcomes that we will evaluate, can evaluate from uh, different uh, criteria. Um, one, uh, if we zoom in into the action situation, we will see that uh, actors have, can have different positions and therefore different actions, different information, uh, and, and also different uh, outcomes and uh, cost and benefits. One of uh, why I, I, I like to use the IED framework because it gives a, a perspective of the problem from different actors and um, provides a way of looking at the problem from these different perspectives and why it might be rational or uh, reasonable for different actors to make decisions, a uh, different type of decisions because they may have different kind of information, different type of positions and different kind of outcomes that they are concerned about. Typically we apply this to natural resource problems, but today I will uh, look at the, uh, the COVID-19 because 
a number of, of issues that we have been seeing in the media on governance issues, um, given that we are kind of uh, trained in using the IAD framework, we look at those uh, governance issues and say, well, this looks very familiar to some of the issues that we are typically concerned about. And I will talk about uh, this, the scale in which uh, decisions are, 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 are made. Um, and I, yeah, as I said, again, I don't want to, uh, I don't know all the details about the COVID uh, situation. So don't want to be pinned on that I make kind of uh, say things that might not be uh, completely correct about uh, uh, all the, the details of the COVID uh, crisis itself. So I will talk about uh, centralized and decentralized action. I think there's a lot of differences between countries and between also states about uh, how um, responses were organized. And I will focus on two different items. Uh, about uh, the, uh, getting the supplies. <clears throat> That's um, one particular focus. Um, and, and I will show that a centralized perspective seems to be an appropriate uh, approach, but about the response of testing and, and reopening the economy might be more a decentralized perspective. Um, so with the, um, with the medical supplies. So, one of the issues, and that's the kind of the uh, uh, part of the, the biophysical context, is that uh, we live in an interconnected world, which caused that the disease was spreading, but also the supply chains are very interconnected. And there are only a limited number of suppliers uh, of the ventilators and other type of uh, uh, equipment that is needed for the uh, medical response. So, so that's an important um, uh, aspect that will, will define how I think might be the best way to respond to this. The attributes of the community is that we, uh, as, as, if I look at uh, it from a US perspective, there has been a focus in the, in the medical sector on uh, efficiency because a lot of these um, uh, the, 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 the medical sector has been uh, focused on uh, privatization and a market competition. So um, that might <clears throat> explain that we don't have um, a large amount of stocks uh, for each hospital about uh, uh, medical supplies. A lot of people are, another aspect is important for the uh, attributes of the communities also that a lot of people are uninsured. So there might be, uh, um, uh, might be a, a reason also to um, um, not to uh, necessarily uh, um, say do test when it's uh, needed. Um, and it's an election year which also impacts um, uh, I think some of the responses uh, by our elected officials. So if we have a number of uh, limited number of suppliers and we have um, a lot of hospitals and states um, uh, needing the, uh, uh, the supplies, um, one of the worst things you can do is that everybody has to compete for the same kind of resource. So, but that's actually what has happened uh, in the US. So uh, they, the suppliers have limited capacity and uh, their incentive is uh, uh, basically they, they, they are um, a private uh, industry. So their typical in, uh, incentive is to, uh, is, is to make a profit, although uh, there might now be other motivations too, but they have no incentive to have an uh, overproduction. So they have a very limited capacity of, um, um, they have a very limited capacity to, uh, to increase their production. The states had also no buffer and they have to make decisions in a huge amount of uncertainty. And uh, they might, there is an, uh, maybe an overreaction to, to, to be safe. And so they all want to have sufficient number of these ventilators and other supplies because 
they may not rely on, on, on uh, maybe not be able to rely on other actors. And especially with a, a federal government who uh, should uh, have had a coordinating role and, and may have done so, but probably not in sufficient uh, way. Um, so we get a lot of um, uh, individual actors, states and hospitals who are getting into bidding wars. Um, um, so they, uh, they could, the federal government could have been more coordinating, so they could have uh, provided uh, 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 kind of, uh, given the limited supplies, they could have uh, uh, coordinated where the supplies went and they could have ordered companies to switch their production as uh, they have the authority to do so. The governors, they, uh, uh, they, have, they think about their, uh, some of them may think about the, the election season and they all have to balance the, the, the economics uh, with uh, the public health situation. So they had uh, been in a, a lot of difficult situations. And uh, the hospitals, they all had a limited capacity and they had to increase the capacity of beds and, and medical supplies. So uh, the outcomes uh, were these, these bidding wars. And uh, so, which is um, pretty inefficient use of tax money given that uh, um, a lot of the money that is then spent on the medical supplies is in the tax money. Um, and um, so a better coordination would have been more effective uh, in terms of cost, but also uh, have a, may have a more fair distribution of medical uh, supplies. Um, well, it's not only medical supplies, as a lot of us have experienced, there was a lot of uh, hoarding behavior too, of all kinds of other items in uh, supermarkets, etc. So, so this kind of challenge of uh, uh, limited number of supplies with the uh, large amount of individual actors who basically uh, uncoordinated started to uh, uh, try to uh, get the supplies uh, lead to these uh, uh, undesirable outcomes. For the testing, um, I think there will be an, an implementation of the recovery. I think there will be a different, uh, uh, there's a different perspective there. Uh, the reason is that uh, there's a lot of differences in the local context in which uh, there is risk of infection. Uh, there are uh, Arizona where uh, most of us are, at least from the, the panelists, most of us are in Arizona that's become a hotspot. And so uh, in the U.S., so there is, uh, there might have a different response than some other, other places. So the response might be different also in terms of kind of the economic uh, activity. There might be different, uh, different ec economic activities in different places. And so that might require different responses. And one of the challenges that we have uh, here in the U.S. is um, uh, the compliance to, to guidelines. Um, rule of uh, responses that may work well in, for example, Sweden might not necessarily do well uh, in, uh, in, in the US. So uh, this in the photo on the, on the left, we see the uh, 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 photo from, from China where everybody wears masks. In the US, this, this becomes a political argument uh, as I also have experienced myself where people uh, don't wear a mask and say they don't believe in the coronavirus. I did not know that it was part of belief systems but uh, this becomes a political debate and if people are less following the guidelines it becomes more and more difficult to actually um, uh, respond appropriately to that. So um, so this is also the uh, part of the, the, the local norms and there might be also differences between states about how people are responding to those uh, to those guidelines and um, unfortunately that may uh, impact the kind of responses that are needed um, so there's a lot of stress on the on the actors in a way there's a uh, a lot of uh, people are 
are uninsured, underinsured, or have in, uh, in, uh, unemployment, are unemployed. So there's a lot of that way stress on the uh, uh, on the actors. Um, uh, there's not enough uh, safety net. These for uh, in the people in the U.S. is a big challenge. There's a distrust in the, the government, and I think uh, a lot of distrust in the uh, lack of leadership. There's no clear message, not coming from the federal level or the state level. Also, the governor of Arizona is, people complain about him that he never wears a mask. So how can, you know, why do we expect uh, citizens to comply if the governor is not complying himself? Um, the, there, there might be a, an overreaction with lockdowns, but that's, I think, uh, from a medical perspective, that's a logical reason because it's, it's difficult to, there was so much uncertainty, this was a logical consequence and it's difficult to know what situation is if you don't see what is happening. It's, uh, it's, and this is a, a general, it's, it's, it's a general problem with this kind of issues. It's actually also with something like climate change. If we are successful in preventing the problem, there seems to be no need for it because you don't see the, 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 the consequences. So now people will say, well, why do we do this for a few hundred uh, patients? But it's difficult to keep complying if you, uh, if you actually, it's, it seems to work very well. So, so this uh, is an um, uh, important challenge, especially now with the reopening. Um, so um, with the local responses, it's, a, it's important for the, uh, uh, that we have this more this local information. So we have a better uh, sense of the risk. We may have more localized responses, local feedback control. And if we have travel restrictions, we will be able to have a more localized uh, 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 response that we could do. So from the kind of the institutional frameworks, we see these different kind of actors playing an important role. And um, in a way, it's the, we come back also to the polycentric governance perspective, uh, the supply of medical equipment, a more centralized response might be needed, but for a more uh, uh, testing and reopening, we may have a more local perspective needed. And so with that, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and will give the floor to Marty Andrews who will talk more about robustness. Okay, thanks Marco. Here, let me uh, <clears throat> get my screen going here. Okay. So I'm gonna show just one picture here uh, of the robustness of social ecological sl systems slash coupled infrastructure systems framework. Uh, I looked over the participant list <clears throat> as Marco was speaking and many of you I know are aware of the uh, basics of the robustness framework so I won't go into that. I would just say that uh, the robustness framework really focuses on systematizing some of the interesting attributes of uh, coupled human natural systems that Marco was just talking about in the context of the IAD framework that really emphasizes the participants, the attributes of the communities, the rules and use, factors for coordination that structure those <clears throat> uh, networks of action situations that underlie all human interactions and in all systems. The robustness framework works on the left-hand side of the IAD framework and asks what is the structure of the interaction between attributes of the community, biophysical context, and rules and use. Biophysical context is depicted in the orange boxes, and <clears throat> attributes of the community um, is depicted in the blue boxes. Uh, so what is the robustness framework instantiated for COVID? Well, it's the same as it always is. It's generalized. Many pictures of the robustness framework typically have resource users, irrigators, harvesters, fishers, uh, you have uh, public infrastructure providers, water users association, fishery users groups, uh, small scale co-op, whatever it is, or agencies, uh, depends on the scale. 
um, that you're thinking about. But here we can be quite general in the sense that it's some rulers, elites, elected officials who are, who are playing roles of public infrastructure providers. Typically the public infrastructure in a fishery are rules about fishing. In irrigation systems, it's uh, rules about providing shared infrastructure in terms of canals and uh, rules about how the, the common pool resource that's made available through that infrastructure is shared. But here, it's all in there. Legal structures, constitutionality of forcing people to stay home, for example, is a discussion. Scientific information, you saw a picture of Marco's presentation of a person getting tested, uh, the costs of testing, <clears throat> communication, how we learn about uh, how many people are infected in our states or our regions, transportation, military, security, all these infrastructures come together to pro provide an extraordinarily complex uh, suite of services in the system. How do we study these? Well, the robustness framework can't help you there. You have to decide what parts of uh, the system that you're going to study. But a basic example, a very obvious example, is the sort of legal and security infrastructure being implemented in states for lockdowns where through link six there's a rule about uh, what businesses are open and uh, what people can actually do how is that information how is that decision made well you see that you'd have scientific uh, infrastructure here uh, who knows something about the ecology of infectious diseases decide on what the safe distance is, what types of activities would be more or less conducive to spreading the virus. <clears throat> so you can see how multiple infrastructures come together to produce what you might call a management feedback loop over here. So there's measurement management uh, that's going on that's, that's separate from the collective action processes where people are deliberating, what do we do? So I just wanted to make a couple of general comments about COVID in particular. Like Marco, I know very little about COVID. I do know something about uh, some infectious diseases, uh, specifically in the dynamic modeling of infectious diseases where, you know, people use those models to determine, you know, how much we can flatten the curve, for example, for uh, the response to infectious diseases. But I like to think about the ecology of infectious disease. We all live in an ecology. We all live in the biosphere. Virus is, is just a predator, or, or uh, it's, a, it's, it's a resource user of us. And uh, it's nothing more than a specific case of ecology. And much of the uh, literature on climate change is also concerned with uh, changes to ecologies, right? Shifting biomes, so on and so forth. The key thing in the robustness framework, though, is to think about the nature of these drivers of exogenous change and the difference here in the two cases, say, between climate change, where we're, we're interested in uh, more frequent extreme weather events, uh, where uh, with globalization, which is endogenous, endogenous to this dynamic feedback rather than endogenous in some ways, exogenous in some ways, you get uh, more extreme uh, infectious disease outbreaks. <clears throat> so we are, through our actions, changing the ecology of infectious disease. So you get different types of extreme events that, that emerge in the system. But relating back to one of our previous uh, webinars, they're just extreme events. Now, what is an extreme event? <clears throat> that's uh, that's uh, difficult to define. Uh, typically, in terms of the disaster and risk management literature, we think about social vulnerabilities that are generated by endogenous human activities that are then amplified into a disaster by a, a, an, an exogenous shock. But what turns it into a disaster is that it exceeds the bandwidth of the capacity of the system to cope with it. So very, very intense rainfall in a very short period. So you can imagine a spike of some sort. Same thing with COVID. The whole point of flattening the curves is to avoid a very sharp increase, a spike in people who need in intensive care uh, uh, in the system. So um, you can think of it that way. Uh, extreme events are becoming more common. That's kind of strange to say. If it's an extreme event, how can it become more common? Because we have this notion that extreme events don't happen very often. But we're thinking here in terms of, uh, in terms of impact and our capacity to cope. Anything you can't cope with uh, becomes extreme. If we can cope with it, it gets less extreme. So that's a key, a key issue to think about. One of the things that has characterized extreme events in the past, and, and thus our institutional responses here, is the uh, extreme events are fairly rare 
even though even though they're becoming more frequent, they're still operating on the on the order of say ten years, maybe a generational time scale. In the past, if we're thinking about the the Spanish flu, a flu of this scale is a hundred year event, although we had SARS. So, you know, do some mental arithmetic and think, okay, 20 years. Well, this, uh, this feedback over here, <clears throat> it's called the sociopolitical feedback. Over here, we have the management feedback. This happens on electoral timescales, three, five, four, two, one, depending on what country you're in or what political system that you're in. What's on people's mind, what issues are salient. Typically, uh, it's not pandemics. Somebody somewhere in this yellow box down here of public infrastructure is supposed to be thinking about that. Who? Who? World Health Organization, CDC, or whatever the equivalent acronym is in your country. Typically, the, full, the, the dynamics over here are fast. So one of the key things we think about in terms of robustness and robustness of institutions is the disparate timescales on which these things operate. Obvious, right? But uh, it does beg the question of how do we actually invest? So this, this, this feedback loop over here is getting, is getting information about well-being and then makes a decision to say, well, we're going to invest so much through link three. Link three is the suite of investments. It determines what, what infrastructure investments are going to be made across this public infrastructure spectrum. What's that choice? What's that vector look like? Right? So over here we have this feedback going on. Uh, Short-term problems tend to be more salient, therefore they pr predominate in this feedback cycle and they get more attention. But then if you think about COVID or other extreme events, it gets a little challenging because you have to think, how, what would you actually invest in? So one could think, well, we should invest in more ventilators. We should build more of them. We should store them in such a way that they're available. That's challenging. Spatial, spatial distribution of ventilators. Whew, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough problem for the scientific public infrastructure. Um, we have to maintain them and, 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 and make sure they're available. Very expensive, very expensive. Even if you could do it, very expensive. Then you have the issue of trade-offs between present moment performance and robustness to extreme events. So I'm just gonna articulate that developing institutions for extreme events are it's a, it's a very difficult challenge. So even if you could do that, we were chatting about this among our colleagues, and then one of my colleagues who does know more about infectious disease than I do said, well, how do you know the next pandemic is going to need ventilators? So you could invest an enormous amount of money in having ventilators based on present information about COVID, and then you're all ready for another COVID, but then the next, <clears throat> the next pandemic uh, is physiologically different. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the ecology of the infectious disease, as is all ecology, extraordinarily complex. So I'm going to emphasize, with extreme events like COVID, the massive uncertainty and complexity that's involved. Now, you heard Simon Levin talk about this in, in a similar discussion um, not long ago with this challenge of complexity and, and trying to develop uh, responses across multiple temporal scales as evolution has created in organisms from very fast at a behavioral level, population level, and then at this very slow evolutionary level. Uh, those ideas are challenging to map into institutional uh, institutional ideas. Uh, I just wanted to uh, comment on uh, thoughts about generalized resilience or generalized robustness, however you want to think of it. What kind of legal or institutional arrangements might be helpful um, uh, to implement regardless? And they may not be that expensive. So we're thinking, what are the cheapest institutional arrangements we can implement. Well, one of those is, and it's been done before in much more extreme situations than COVID is, <clears throat> trying to work through link six to reduce the intensity of citizens' responses to lack of information. What is that? I don't know what's gonna happen with COVID, so I'm gonna go buy toilet paper. So we had this picture that Marco showed. Uh, I think some low cost information, low cost institutions that could be put into place would be very careful thinking about anti hoarding institutions. So say, you know, if some major public health, uh, major public health shock occurs, uh, there's a centralized response to all, all um, retailers who, who then are uh, asked to at least at a minimum, uh, try to do their best to reduce those rapid responses to uncertainty in hoarding. The other kind of generalized uh, institutional arrangements that, that might be 
might be put into place would have to do with information rules, more, more strict reporting of, uh, or, or testing capacity uh, to put in, put in place. But when you have multiple jurisdictions and there's no central controller, uh, you'd have to regularize or build collaborative institutions at the global scale. Sound familiar? Climate change, same kinds of problems. So um, I'm gonna stop there and, and open up for discussion. Uh, I hope that some of this thinking uh, that's facilitated by uh, the frameworks uh, is helpful. So Adela may have some questions for us. Yes, I do have some questions. And then if anybody uh, who's participating has questions, um, please place them in the Q&A box and uh, we'll, I'll make sure that they uh, are addressed. So <laughs> this is, I really like the uh, comparing the COVID crisis to climate change um, because on a lot of dimensions, um, the two uh, are similar from uh, global impacts to local responses. And um, in, I have a, a couple of questions for you though, Marco. Um, one of your arguments was that um, competition among jurisdictions and states and the federal government to acquire uh, equipment um, led to really just a waste of resources and, um, and other uh, outcome, less desirable outcomes. But so could you say something maybe a little more, under what conditions would you expect competition to lead to uh, those types of outcomes? And under what conditions do you want competition to operate in order to achieve desirable outcomes. Like why is competition bad? Yeah, competition in itself is, is, is not bad. Uh, uh, this particular case, the, the time scale, uh, competition might be good if there will be new players will come with new uh, uh, alternatives and, and, and could be part of the competition. But at, at the time scale was so fast that there were only a limited number who could not increase their production. I saw a little documentary of the company who uh, makes those hand sanitizer. And so they have been, they, are, they can increase their production by say 40% in two months time or something like that. So yeah, you, of course we were never thinking about hand sanitizers the whole time a few months ago. Uh, but now that's they have um, they, they, their demand was more than increased more than forty percent, uh, so probably tripled or something like that. So in that situation, um, it's not that new actors can come up to the market with a with an alternative. And so in that case, it's it's a kind of a we have a few. I'm thinking about the natural resource. We have a we have a few wells left, and everybody is free to. To uh, uh, to hunt for them, and so it's the it's the competition for the the few resources left, and uh, so in that way, in that situation, competition might not be uh, good. With the vaccine uh, development, this is uh, useful to have competition, and to uh, there are I think more than hundred uh, vaccines in development. They may all fail. Uh, we have no idea what may work. Uh, remember that we never got a vaccine for SARS. Um, so um, they were in the process of um, the developing and testing it, but then at that time there was the SARS epidemic was um, over and people didn't continue that kind of research. But it's good at the moment that there's a lot of competition for vaccine and there's a lot of incentives to be, have the winner in a way. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Yeah. yeah, but I think for this limited amount of resources, this was a, this was a, yeah. I think we all were harvesting for the same uh, limited amount of species left. Yeah. 
uh, interesting. So, uh, Marty, you wanted to join in here. I just wanted to make a quick comment on uh, aspects of competition. Typically, uh, competition will generate specialization. So if you're going to win in a particular market or sector, you're going to specialize uh, to to be the best producer in that field. Uh, that makes your infrastructure more fragile or brittle in the sense that it's not multi-purpose. It's single purpose and it's optimized. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about generalized infrastructure to cope with the kinds of changes that are coming, one could argue, oh, do we have a sort of generalized production capacity? Do we have a technology that's generalized so that we can switch tech, switch production as needed, say, for hand sanitizer, for example? Some of that kind of technology is coming down a pipeline like 3D metal printing, where you, you just need to you just turn on the metal printer and you don't have to build uh, rigid supply chain. So it's an interesting trade-off between competition for performance and robustness, this, this performance robustness trade-off. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a question in the uh, chat, and that is, following this discussion, is global public health a common good? If so, is it right to make profits from it by stimulating competition? So I think there are a number of different dimensions to, to this question. So uh, I guess one is that, uh, uh, is that a, a human right in that way? Uh, so um, there, there, there are a lot of issues with competition uh, of what affects scene and, and, I, and that's also what a lot of what I, how I follow it from the World Health Organization. Uh, what is part of the role of the World Health Organization, I also I understood that part of what a lot of these companies who are involved have uh, agreed to that they will not um, that they will share it in um, at uh, at at cost in a way. So so that but the whole process about if there will be a vaccine, uh, how that will be distributed. I think that's a whole other process. I think you need to have competition because uh, a lot of the also the the scientists and uh, the companies to put in their resources they might be incentivized to put in a lot of effort then the question is how will this be distributed and then you get to the the fairness of will they get the, the the outcomes and um i think that and i think don't think that they have really a they are discussing about that there should be a protocol for that um but that's a different, I think, a different question, the distribution versus the development of the framework. Um, even if it is as cost basis, their reputation of those, those companies will, will make the developing, uh, the, the vaccine, uh, the scientists may get the Nobel Prize and uh, the company will make this that they, they have a huge uh, reputation benefit. So even if they don't make direct uh, profit, they may benefited in the long term, uh, but it's a major challenge about how this will be distributed in a fair way. And I, that, that will be very, I will be very worried about that because um, I think, uh, um, well, living in, uh, in the US, I maybe uh, have easier access than a lot of uh, uh, colleagues uh, around the world. And that, that will be a yeah, how do we define the, the, the distribution? That's, um, and that's, that's why it's also unfortunate that the uh, US uh, withdraw from the World Health Organization because that's part of the role of the World Health Organization is the distribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marty, did you want to weigh in there? Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting question. And I think uh, one of the answers is that it's difficult to define a public good cleanly. Uh, that's why we really like to think in terms of coupled infrastructure systems. There really are no clean definitions, right? You can't get to Yosemite without some roads and a car. So you have to mobilize your private car infrastructure on the shared highway infrastructure to get to the public infrastructure, right? So when you're thinking of information and material flows, we really have to think about these coupled inf infrastructure systems. So then you can actually rationally think about what is it that the, the government invests in? What kinds of infrastructure does the government invest in to mobilize private 
infrastructures and the capacity of competition to solve problems faster and perhaps more cheaply than, than uh, other methods. So the, the key institutional design question is what do we actually put in place for these kinds of events where you don't want purely public because it might be slow and not efficient without a profit motive, but you also don't want a profit motive playing a role in a public good like that. There's always a profit motive somewhere, no matter what kind of structure you have, but it might be that there are guardrails put into place. Like for example, you know, you have to, if you're gonna develop this vaccine, you can get these other benefits, you can get this much profit to cover your costs. And you know, you're always gonna have players in that system working that way, but I don't think it's a matter of public health versus private. It's just a complex of public, public and private infrastructures that work together. And this leads to another question that was uh, uh, put into the Q&A box, and that is, what would be the most important changes to make to the frameworks you've described to improve our responses to the next pandemic? And I guess you could also look at it the other way. What would be the most important responses to the next pandemic that the frameworks might suggest now? So, uh, yeah. I, well, one thing that, given that, uh, well, the Resilience Alliance is, 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 is one of the sponsors of this uh, series, and it's, we, we always talk about, and that was also Simon Levin talked about, the redundancy, diversity, and modularity, and um, there was not much redundancy. The, 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 there is some overcapacity in uh, normal uh, situations for uh, emergency rooms and equipment, but um, the, the, that that was not prepared for this kind of event. Um, I, I have I've, I'm surprised about the the failing leadership uh, in many places around the world. Uh, you would, uh, people are trained. Uh, there is a lot of training about also for people in, in business and also for people in government about how to deal with this extreme situation. They have these scenario plannings. And we know that they also did that in the Trump administration and, um, and they actually identified that there were issues. Um, I'm surprised that, um, nothing really has been learned from those cases. Making decisions under a huge amount of uncertainty is something we will have to do too with climate change when those, we, we know that there will be a, 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 this, this big problem, climate change will come up. We don't know exactly how this will play out, but making decisions in a huge amount of uncertainty, it seems to be that we are not very well prepared with that. Um, and I wonder about how can we improve some of uh, the, uh, the, the decision making. Uh, I'm not sure. So maybe if I um, if I want to relook some of some of the frameworks is to to think more about decision making under a huge amount of uncertainty. That seems to be a uh, uh, yeah. There seems to be a lot of. Um, and we don't know the best, also now we don't know what's the best answer. Uh, because we, flattening the curve may just postponing some of the problems. Uh, so that's why people say you need to have herd immunity. Uh, we don't know what is the best answer. But not making a decision is not really, that's a, a, a lack of leadership. And that could, may only cause more problems. So I think that's to me one of the surprises and we have never really focus that much, but we always know that good leadership is important, but we don't know what it actually is. And it's, I'm surprised about the, the, yeah, the lack of ability to make decisions on the huge amount of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I would agree exactly with that issue of uncertainty. I think that um, like with climate change, there are more and more local communities starting to think about local climate adaptation policy rather than thinking in terms of putting the, the responsibility on national level or global level actors. Uh, I would say that we would, the, using the framework language, you wanna create action, uh, action arenas, action situations where local communities can come together and uh, have, have a real education about 
you, science, other infrastructures cannot cope with extreme events. We have to make difficult decisions about trade-offs in terms of present well-being versus investments in these long-term structures. And Marco mentioned diversity, modularity, redundancy. How do you build generalized response capacity for those three things that we know are important and having those having those discussions in communities at the local level uh, uh, so that everyone's aware of the trade-offs that are involved. How do we pay for it and what do we do? And then, and then of course, you have multi-level polycentric governance structures at higher levels to think about what's best for each, each re region. So polycentricity, massive uncertainty. So polycentricity from generalized ostromology, uh, action, uh, action arenas from the IAD and modularity, <clears throat> diversity, redundancy, and feedbacks from the robustness framework. Could you say a little bit more about polycentricity? That's one of the questions that was asked is uh, the benefits of polycentricity, especially what would the role of states be in, uh, in a response? Yeah, no, I, I think it's um, in the reopening of the economy is really critical uh, because we will be in this for a long time. And so what is the best way uh, to do that is something that uh, we have to work, find out together. And, and um, there might be different industries, uh, different type of industries. Uh, there might be different information. I, uh, I'm from the Netherlands and I know that in the Netherlands they have maps about areas where the, about risk of getting infected. So where, where are the places uh, where, where the most cases? So people may be able to uh, respond differently in different places. So now we know that in Arizona, it's, we get, a, uh, get more cases. So we may have to be uh, adjust a little bit uh, to be more precautious uh, about this. Um, there were also, in the beginning, we don't, don't know whether climate would play a role. Uh, so that could have also play a role. But it seems, given that, uh, it seems not um, that uh, the the heat uh, reduced the amount of uh, cases here in Arizona. So, um, but I think the, uh, and the governors may work with uh, local officials to, to find out what's the best way to, to respond. Unfortunately, they do not, uh, there has been a complaint also here from the mayor of Phoenix uh, will complain that she want to have stricter rules but the, the state uh, did not allow that so there is some uh, uh, challenges there so uh, but i think uh, you want to allow some uh, variability in responses because there is a, a diversity of, of of risk and uh, you cannot combine it uh, you have to think also about uh, reopening the economy we have to uh, in that way be more tailored to the, the situation yeah, I just wanted to uh, reflect a bit on Lee's really work on metropolitan policing and, and thinking about uh, what types of infrastructures should be provided uh, at each level where it makes the most sense. So, uh, you know, the idea that not every local precinct needs a detailed uh, comprehensive crime lab, not every city needs a vaccination development team. So uh, if we think carefully through the different infrastructures that are necessary, uh, again, thinking in terms of this hierarchy of responses, behavioral, population level, physiological, you know, that, that come from evolution, uh, where we actually have decision making power and action power in place at different levels of governance to react to uh, different uh, problems that emerge on different timescales, as Marco just suggested. It may be that in some places, uh, you know, you can reopen the economy more rapidly for whatever local context you have, and others, uh, 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 an actor needs to have more control, uh, more capacity to say, no, we're going to shut shut down again because we're having a huge uptick till we figure out why we are different than everybody else. But it, it, it also depends very much on the, because we talk about feedback uh, systems, uh, uh, the lack of uh, testing, which is a lot of uh, uh, testing capacity, which is a lot of lack of 
coordination, getting the supplies uh, makes it uh, difficult to, to have this more localized uh, response. So, so that's the, I think one of the challenges and why this is also a polycentric system, because if there was sufficient um, um, capacity to, uh, to know where the, uh, the uh, we, when it started, we, we were told, well, let's, we, should, we should just assume that everybody has the coronavirus because we don't know. We, there's no testing done. So now there's some more testing, but not sufficient to, to really go very detailed in a localized response. So that's, that's, I think over time, we may get more localized response because we will have better uh, monitoring of the situation. Um, another question is, could COVID be identified as an external perturbation in the context of an existing, in the context of a pre-existing system? How could it impact on the already established rules and use? So, uh, COVID, uh, well, the coronavirus is in that way not new. Uh, uh, as, as some people uh, know that, they, I think it was in 18, 1890 or something like that, uh, there, there might have been a, a coronavirus pandemic. They only know that there were a lot of people had uh, a similar uh, um, issues. Uh, so this variation of the coronavirus is new, um, uh, but pandemics are, are, are not new. It's just that these kind of extreme cases, uh, extreme events, uh, are, we, we are, might be new for, for, for us in a way. Um, and the world has changed a lot. Uh, um, in two weeks, we will hear from a historian about uh, pand pandemics, uh, Tina de Moore. Uh, there, they, they knew that uh, uh, in, an, in a town uh, uh, so many miles away, they have the plague and this may come to their situation. So now everything is uh, changing so rapidly that uh, I think for this globalized world, it's, it's, a, it's a new, uh, new situation. Um, I think it will impact, I think it has, will have many impacts. Um, one, we, it's, it's a shared experience from all over the world, so this might also have some benefits. Um, um, I think the, the current uh, uh, protests also uh, uh, are influenced by the shared experience. Um, so, so I think that there, there are also some, uh, as people say, there are also some uh, possible examples set about how you could get a rapid change, although the amount of environmental benefits are pretty small compared to what is needed for something like climate change. So uh, just not uh, stopping the economy is not really a, uh, uh, the best strategy. Um, but uh, yeah, also maybe uh, it may impact uh, the perceptions uh, of uh, what we do, as we saw in the, the, the first episode of this uh, series, uh, that uh, we are typically in a rat race of more production and uh, this might lead to this kind of accidents, uh, so zoonotic diseases. Uh, so that might lead to some reflection and I, I think this may we don't know yet what the, the change will be, but I think this is a very uh, important uh, uh, impact on our lives. Uh, maybe not as much for me as for a lot of people in developing countries will have much more severe consequences because they, uh, my salary is continuing, I still can teach, etc. But for a lot of people in developing countries, the consequences are more severe and I think we are just starting at the beginning in what happened with uh, the food production, et cetera, but we will, it may impact a lot about how we may want to rebuild the economy and how we look at, uh, at ourselves, our own priorities. This is a great question uh, regarding system definition. In theory, 
at very large temporal and spatial scales, everything is endogenous. So if you view coronavirus as uh, a product of evolutionary processes, yes, of course, everything is endogenous. On the other hand, from a practical analytical perspective, you have to draw your line somewhere. And when you do that, you identify a reasonable time scale. So on say, I don't know, 20 to 30 year multi-decadal time scales, absolutely coronavirus or any pandemic or even large climate events can be viewed as exogenous drivers of existing systems. But then you're faced with what's the existing system. Of course, this is just the process of analyzing some issue or problem. And if you're thinking about present healthcare, present transportation, again, thinking about infrastructures, if you think about present transportation infrastructures, present healthcare infrastructures, uh, you can say, oh, okay, how would this shock impact those, hopefully, uh, in a lasting way? And one is transportation infrastructures. 9-11 had a huge impact on transportation infrastructures. We now take for granted all the rules and use associated with what you can take through uh, airport security. So uh, whenever I go to China, I walk through this temperature taking machine, some infrastructure to take my temperature. Um, uh, in, in the US, under its uh, institutional arrangements that might be viewed potentially unconstitutional personal information, that's a coordination discussion that has to be had. So for sure, generalized infrastructure to monitor the movement of organisms would be one. Um, and, and maybe just a generalized reduction in flight capacities, allowed flights uh, could be uh, one response. Another response might be, again, increased investment in flexible capacity to produce what you might call generalized immune responses that, that work no matter what the uncertainty is. How easy is that? Face masks. I guarantee you though, right now we'd be saying duh, but in 20 years, same thing will happen again. Why? Because, as I mentioned early on, you have these very localized shocks that with, with a time period in between that exceed the memory of not only individual humans, but the memory of, of, uh, of economic systems. You just forget who, who wants to keep a bunch of um, supply, uh, or, uh, supply chains in motion or ready to go for 20 years when there's no need for them. Huge challenges, I think. We have another <clears throat> question, and it might be our last one because we only have a couple of minutes, but it raises an interesting point. And um, that is, how uh, can we use frameworks to simplify? Whoop. No, I, there were actually a couple more questions. So <laughs> let me go back to the other one. How do these frameworks handle situations when the rules and use continue to evolve. And I wanna add on to that uh, point that you were making, which is how can you maybe get norms or rules to evolve more quickly? So you showed the picture of all the face mask wearing people in the subway that couldn't have been taken in the US. I think a number of us are concerned about, are we going to see our classrooms filled with face mask wearers in the fall, which we hope we see. How do we how, yeah, talk about norms and evolution and so fast and long? The, uh, the case about mask in class, uh, the disc, I'm in the university senate and we, we meet with the president of the university uh, now regularly to, to talk about the opening. And, and yes, they, the, the students will be asked to make a pledge that they understand that they they have to comply with those kind of uh, rules, and uh, and he says he will not have. You can expel somebody from the class not wearing a mask. That's that they have to be understand it. Yeah. So I don't know how that will work in practice, but um, yeah. So, but it, the Chinese can, actually I had mask at home from my travel to China because of the air pollution there. Um, so, so I, I had a little supply left, so I was uh, happy with that. But China has a long history why they, in a way, have these particular norms for authority, and um, and I, I and I th I don't think it will be very. I I think it might be almost a given that these norms will change only briefly, also maybe at a generational level. Um, 
but yeah, I, I'm, I'm surprised how that people all start, yeah, start having debates about uh, that they make it political and, and not trust uh, at medical advice uh, and don't wear a mask because it's a, they are born in a free country and they should be able, allowed to do whatever they want, which is of course not true. Uh, there, are, there are many things uh, that uh, also they themselves argue are not allowed to, uh, to be done. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting how in some places this become all mixed with uh, ideology and worldviews. Um, and in other places, uh, people follow the, uh, the advice of the medical sector. And, and um, I'm not saying that one or the other might necessarily be better. Because um, what if the, what if the uh, medical specialists might have all wrong in hindsight? Um, that we should have stayed open and uh, that would have been in the end might we may find out that would have been a better decision but in the end the political actors have to make a decision and the, me the medical sector is one of those who make decisions uh, uh, or advice it's not that Dr. Fauci was uh, ruling the country but I think it will be the fact that frameworks might not be used is because I don't think frameworks are useful for policy makers um, I teach uh, a freshman class on uh, mathematics for sustainability and now I realize that teaching exponential growth is actually something uh, critical <laughs> because if people would have understood some of the people in uh, 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 places of decision making uh, would have understood uh, exponential growth, uh, better decisions could have been made. So um, I think those kind of changes in concepts and understanding is a long process, a slow process. Marty, do you have anything? Uh... Uh, yeah, just in the interest of time, um, I think that the institutional analysis machinery, including the framework, frameworks really helps clarify this question in a practical way for people. You have a trade-off between formal institutional responses and Forms, informal responses. Most people who don't do institutional analysis don't think carefully about transaction costs. They think when they hear the term transaction costs, they think, well, that's the charge that your bank charges you, you know, when you take some money out or whatever. But we know that having a conversation outside of the farming day with your colleagues about what's going to happen tomorrow is the transaction costs to operationalize institutions. So uh, I was part of a, a fun study or paper we wrote some time ago called Social Norms as Solutions, where we kind of explore this question and suggest how social norms might, might be a, play an incredibly important role. Social norms are important. Think about smoking indoors. Think about foot binding in China. Those things last centuries, then all of a sudden, just because it starts to become uncomfortable to not participate. So maybe in 10 years time, if there's a signal from the government, there's, there's a dangerous virus, it will be very uncomfortable for somebody to go outside without a mask. And then everybody will go out and I'm putting my mask on. Just like people don't smoke in restaurants anymore. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. I think uh, we're out of time. And uh, uh, Marco, do you uh, have a few closing words? Well, um, yeah, I think this is a, a situation where we, we all, in a way, uh, uh, struggle with. It's also um, applying our professional thinking to this kind of uh, problems will help us to a lot to think about governance that may benefit uh, not only the COVID-19, but also future problems. So I, that, that's why we should that's why we start this series. We should not waste this crisis. We should learn from it and try to improve uh, what we may do for a future crisis. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs>